Hi everyone, you all hear me okay? Uh, my name is Matthew Zipkin. I work for a company called Impervious. We work on Bitcoin <laughs> software and Handshake software. This is uh, my PGP public key fingerprint. Maybe by the end of the talk, you guys will kind of know what that means, but it's good to associate that with an actual human. Um, so I haven't given a talk like this in front of an actual human audience in a very long time because of the pandemic, so I'm pretty excited to actually be here and have some humans around. I thought I would start with an actual audience, some little audience interaction. How many people here own a domain name? All right. How many people own Bitcoin? Okay, great, great. Um, so question three, what is ownership? All right, here's a quote. Rule of thumb is if you can stand in front of it with an assault rifle and physically protect it, then it's real. Now, I don't particularly like guns that much, or Ann Barkhart, but I think she kind of nailed it with this. So, who owns a domain name? Aha, okay, you guys probably must be talking about handshake domains. Handshake domains are domains you can own. You can stand in front of it with a gun if that's your thing. Um, and I'm going to talk about how we could do that. So these are some screenshots I took from my phone, regular old iPhone uh, with a special browser installed. These are websites that are uh, hosted on Handshake domains. And I want you to notice that there's a lock icon in front of each of them. They are all HTTPS, HTTPS impervious, HTTPS HNS.blockLock, HTTPS library genesis. So the two of these are websites that are hosted directly on a TLD without any subdomains, without any dots, which is pretty cool. The one in the middle has got a dot, it's got a subdomain, but block clock obviously is a top level domain you won't find in the ICANN root zone. These are screenshots I took with my actual phone on a regular internet connection with a special browser, sure, but they are rendered with a, they're, they're loaded securely directly from the web server. So the, the, the guy who can stand in front of this domain name with a gun and his server is talking directly to my phone, no trusted third parties at all. It's secure even from the mobile device. So here's how we do that. There's a couple ingredients. Um, first is DNSSEC. These pictures are from a very long YouTube video, which you can find about the ICANN 2017 uh, KSK key signing key party. They got all these nerds in the basement, and they've got cameras set up, and there's an incredibly strict protocol. You can see they got clipboards with papers and outlines on a table where everything has to go, and they do things step by step. And what these guys are doing is generating a cryptographic public key. That is the most important uh, key on the internet. It's the key that secures the root zone. It's the key that makes all top-level domains secure, and then from there, those top-level domains can make your sub-level, uh, second-level domains secure and like that. Is any, anyone in this room actually in this, in this, in this picture? From my hand? Okay. Um, this ceremony in particular is the very precise thing that the Handshake blockchain replaces. Um, and we'll talk about that. The, the, the next crucial ingredient for website security is certificate authority. When you go to a website, you get a green lock icon in your browser that tells you that your connection is secure to that web server. How do you, how does your browser know that it's secure? Well, um, if you go to Bitcoin.com, I think that's where I took this screenshot from, yeah. You go to Bitcoin.com and look at the certificate. You can see that the certificate from the web server at Bitcoin.com is signed by Cloudflare, which is signed by something called Baltimore Cyber Trust Group. Who's ever heard of Baltimore Cyber Trust Root before? All right. Every single person in here, all your computers trust Baltimore Cyber Trust Root. Not only that, but all these other uh, root certificates that, that I took a screenshot from, 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 from my computer and, and hundreds more. As soon as you walk out of the store with a computer, you trust all these entities. Your computer trusts Baltimore Cyber Trust Root to tell you when you're actually looking at Bitcoin.com and when you're not. So you guys all trust this. And 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 Baltimore Cyber Trust Root thinks that they can trust Bitcoin.com because of DNSSEC. So we got these nerds in the basement in LA, and we've got all these entities that we just kind of trust when you buy an operating system, and that's how we get security on the web. That's what the lock on your browser means. This is what we're going to try to replace uh, with Handshake. Um, so I'm going to kind of wave my hand at some of the technical stuff, but it's important to know a few things. Asymmetric cryptography. Just to get some, some definitions out there, what we're talking about here is a, is, a, is a key pair, a private key and a public key. I got This is a slide from one of my more technical talks where I use the Simpsons kind of all over the place. But the point is that, that Lisa has generated a key. She could sign a message. Uh, Bart and Nelson can verify that Lisa was the person who wrote and signed that message <coughs> and have her public key. Private key, by the way, nothing really that special about it. Private key is a very, very big, very, very random number that is so big 
and so random, nobody in the future of time will ever generate the same number ever again. And that is how we get cryptographic security. And that ability to generate a really big random number, you can do it on any device. You can do it on an Arduino, you can do it on your phone, Raspberry Pi, it's not special. And I mean, it's special, it's cool, it's like, it's like, it's like magic, but it's not expensive to do. And that's how uh, any human with a $1 computer can get cryptographic security because you can generate a random number the NSA will never generate again. All right. Um, so the private key is the thing, technically, that I was alluding to with the Ann Barhart quote that you can stand in front of with a gun. Um, there's lots of ways to secure a private key. It's not really that long. You can write it down on a piece of paper. Um, Central Nick stores a lot of private keys for all of you guys. They, they manage top level domains. They sign DNSSEC um, on the live DNS system. They use this thing called an N-Trust. It's an HSM, stands for Hardware Security Module or Hardware Signing Machine, something like that. Basically what that box does is it generates one of those really big, really random private key numbers um, and it never lets it go ever. But it can sign messages. You give it a message and it'll give you the signature for that message. But the whole point is that that private key is really safe in there. On the right, I got something called a ledger. This is about the size of a USB drive. This is something in the cryptocurrency space, we call it a hardware wallet. Uh, ledger is one of a, a dozen or so brands um, that produces hardware wallets, and it does the same thing. It generates a private key, it keeps it really, really safe. You cannot get the private key out of that device. It's in there forever. And um, what you can do is sign messages with it. So if we're talking about Bitcoin, for example, you want to send some Bitcoin, you create a transaction with your laptop, Put the transaction to this little guy, this little guy signs it, gives you the signature back. That's how you send Bitcoin while keeping your private key safe. You can stand in front of this thing. And you notice that the picture I got here, this is a Ledger Nano S Plus. I got a Bitcoin app and a Handshake app on it. You can use this with Handshake today. Um, so, uh, so I'll just stick on this for one more second. So, so private key is how we can own our domain names um, with, with, with true ownership. You really own it in a way that nobody else can take it away from you. You can physically protect it by just generating a random number, which you can do with any type of piece of technology. Now, the other parts of the protocol, um, things like, well, how do we know who owns what name? So that's great, you got a private key and a name. How does everyone else in the world know who owns what name? And that's where we start talking about consensus. We all have to agree, everybody, every participant in the system has to agree on who owns what and what the rules are and stuff like that. And I'll talk about the handshake, the auction system, and how we distribute names. Um, but really quick, proof of work. Proof of work is, is a bit of a buzzword. You've seen it in the news, maybe. It applies to blockchains like Handshake and Namecoin and Bitcoin and several others. Um, and how I want you to think of proof of work is kind of like this. Uh, if you flip the penny, what are the odds it's going to land heads up? 50%. You can probably accomplish that goal in two tries. Well, what if I wanted you to get heads twice in a row? Now the probability is down to 25%. If you had two pennies and you threw them in the air, probably, you'd probably have to do that about four times to get two heads up, right? So we go down like that. Every time I add a penny, it doubles and it gets harder and harder and harder and harder and harder. When we scale it up to the actual um, blockchain, now it's starting to look like this. This is an actual block hash. You don't need to really worry about what a hash is. But the important thing is right now we have the binary. Look at all those zeros, 63 zeros there. So if I was going to give you 63 pennies, and tell you to throw them up in the air until they all landed heads up, how long would that take you? Probably forever. Probably not enough time left in the universe for a human being with a bunch of pennies to actually do that. Um, it's so hard to do, in fact, that we actually get security out of that. Even when we, get, even when we put this into a computer, 63 leading zeros, um, it takes, I got the number here, I don't even know how many billions that are, quadrillions or something, six pentagillions hashes per second. That's how many times computers are flipping these pennies up in the air. And with even with that insane amount of work, of, a, of attempts, it still takes 10 minutes for somebody to land all 63 of those pennies heads up, okay? So just, it's kind of abstract, but the, the point is that this is incredibly hard to do, it's incredibly expensive to do, but it's incredibly easy to verify, right? I can look at that, I can count you got 63 zeros, okay, you must have done it. And since I know it's such a hard thing to do, I can assume you actually spent six pence a quadrillion to a billion hashes to get there. You sure right. that's not the national debt? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like the national debt, yeah, that's right. For, for every penny in the United States national debt, if you flip the coin, you might have that same hash rate as, as Bitcoin or um, Okay, so that's, so we got the, the cryptography is how you keep your own assets safe. Proof of work is how the whole system comes to a, a, a conclusion on what the state of the system is and makes it incredibly hard to cheat, incredibly expensive to cheat. 
Um, okay, so now that we got our proof of work, we got our asymmetric cryptography, we got DNSSEC, we got certificate authority, now we can kind of start putting it together and talking about what Handshake actually does. And the thing that makes um, these uh, Handshake domains work securely is something called Dane. Uh, I forgot what the acronym stands for. It's a main authentication of named entities, something like that. Um, Dane is not a new technology. We didn't invent it. It's, it's old. There's probably some people either here or downstairs who remember when it was first proposed. It says, you know, it's, it's almost as old as DNS. Um, and nobody uses it. It has some, some drawbacks. And you guys have maybe read very popular articles about um, why DNSSEC is lame and why Dane isn't necessary, how it just slows things down. And blockchain domains give Dane a new life. It really gives Dane a reason to exist. Because instead of just trusting those guys in the basement with the key or trusting entities like Baltimore Cyber Trust Root, Dane actually closes the loop between everything and, and puts everything into a, a, a cryptographic package that can all be verified on very small devices. So just really quick, if, if you have a, uh, a handshake domain name and you want to host a website like Library Genesis did, you got your web server and you have a self-signed certificate. So you make your own SSL certificate. You don't need to use EFF. You don't need to use CertBot. You definitely don't need to call Cloudflare or CyberTrust Root. You generate your own certificate. You generate your own really big, really random number. It's all yours. And you sign it yourself because we don't need an authority figure. We've got cryptography and proof of work. So that certificate lives on your server. And then someone wants to go to your website. Well, first they need the blockchain so they can verify the proof of work. They can verify the cryptography to see who's supposed to actually own the name library genesis, let's say. And you verify a bunch of data, you verify some signatures, and eventually you verify that the um, uh, TLS certificate you're looking at belongs to the person who owns the website, and it's all very secure. This is it. This is what's happening on, on my phone when I made those screenshots in the beginning. I got a blockchain, I got uh, some cryptography, I got the web server, I got the certificate. There's no ICANN, there's no Cloudflare, there's no Verify, uh, VeriSign, um, you know, there's, there's, there's no Google, you, you own this, okay? There's no, VeriSign cannot take your name away. They cannot put a man in the middle attack your server and, and stick content in there that you didn't want. It's all secure, it's all self-contained. Um, so we can talk a little bit about how the, the names in the Handshake system work and then we'll kind of all, all bring it together. Um, the Handshake, uh, all names on the Handshake blockchain are top level domains, it is a root zone. Um, last I checked, there's over 6 million names on the Handshake blockchain. It's only been about two years, and we're already up to about 6 million names. These top-level domains go basically on top of the current ICANN root zone. So um, I've been using Handshake resolvers on all of my devices for three years. Never had a single issue visiting any website ever. Com, works, org, net, the whole. ICANN root zone is still there. Um, plus, we get all these extra top-level domains from the blockchain. I have some examples here. Galaxy, Venue, Castle. ICANN is a top level domain you can acquire on the Handshake blockchain. We'll talk about that. Um, Namescon, like that. Um, some top level domains from the ICANN root zone have actually claimed their name on the Handshake blockchain, like uh, Gay, Inc., Tattoo, and Wiki. These top level domain, um, it's all one entity, I think. They own these top level domains in the ICANN space. They now own those strings on the Handshake blockchain. And um, the way that the Handshake Resolver works is that it prefers the, uh, the Handshake name. So .gay is now a Handshake name. That means even if ICANN were to take away .gay or give it to someone else or do something with it, whoever owns it today owns it on the Handshake blockchain forever. And if you have a Handshake Resolver, those .gay names will continue to resolve um, how that owner wants them to. That, 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 that is the preference, the Handshake Resolver will prefer the blockchain version of the name. Um, so you guys probably, hopefully, all thinking about name collisions. Let's talk about that at the bar. We'll just kind of skip that. Um, this uh, this kind of outlines the, the different states that a handshake name can be in. There's an auction process I've kind of outlined in blue. When you want a name on the handshake blockchain, if you want library genesis, you have to open an auction for it, bid on it, have the highest, have the, have the highest bid, stuff like that. The DNSSEC proof I have there on the white box is another way to acquire a name. This is what .gay, .inc, .tattoo, .wiki have done. Also what Namecheap.com has done to acquire their um, TLD Namecheap on the Handshake blockchain um, and thousands of others. There's something like 90,000 reserved names, your names that are on the Handshake blockchain that are reserved for their current owners in the, in the legacy ICANN namespace, just for a couple more years. 
Um, and then you can see, you know, you can, you can, uh, you got to renew the name every two years. That's a handshake rule. You can transfer it. Um, we have a, this weird exception where if, if you're fighting over a name, someone has managed to steal your private key, you can kind of burn the name forever. Anyways, just to show you um, sort of the ins and the outs of the, of the handshake name. Um, all right, this is where it's going to get super fun. So um, everything I've said so far about ownership and, and consensus and, and you know, ICANN, certificate authorities thing, basically applies to all the blockchain name systems you guys have heard of. And I know that there's a lot. I got only like 12 of them here, but it's I got Handshake, Namecoin, Solana's got one, Unstoppable Domains, Tezos Domains, Emmercoin, Ethereum name system, Polkadot name system, Rusa, it, it, every blockchain's got their own naming system, and this is like the new hotness. Like, if you guys are into cryptocurrency in 2017, maybe you remember like ICOs, like altcoins and stuff like that all happening. This is like the new thing. Everybody wants to have their own naming system. Um, and you can see a lot of the common buzzwords here. Uh, everybody likes to talk about NFTs. They like to talk about wallet naming. Um, they want to talk about decentralization and censorship resistance, and all that generally applies to everything I've said so far. But we're going to talk about a few things that make Handshake a little special, and also a few reasons why these buzzwords um, are maybe not that great. So a lot of these systems want to talk about wallet naming, because cryptocurrency addresses are so long and complicated. I don't want you to send money to blah, 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 blah. I just want you to send it to Matt Zipkin, and I want that to be easy. Um, so what these naming systems do is they associate a cryptocurrency wallet address, something that's long and not human readable, with the domain name. Um, here's one, an ENS name, Vitalik.eth. Vitalik Buterin is a, is a, is a found, one of the founders of Ethereum. Here's his wallet address. He has $1.9 million in it. This is what wallet naming does. It puts your name on the internet with your balance and all your transaction history. This is terrible. This is why Bitcoiners are, we don't use, we don't reuse addresses. We don't want to pick a static address and put our name on it and tell the whole world because, what? what? Um, so I don't think that wallet naming is such a great use case anyway. And because this is already out there, people want to do wallet naming with Handshake. And we figured out a way to basically, if you, if you run a server, um, you can issue a new wallet address with every, every request and maintain that anonymity. Every time somebody sends you money, they send it to a brand new address that no one's ever seen before. It's randomly generated on the fly. And you and the, recipient, and the sender are the only people who know about it. You can still do that with a name. But these, you know, these guys want uh, these guys want you to, to put your name with a with a bank account number on that. Everybody see it. I don't like it. So go ahead, unstoppable domains, Tezos domains, Pona. Spend all your time working on this. It's great. Handshake is just basically more focused on websites than wallet naming. Um, two, decentralized DNS. Another one of these great buzzwords. Um, I'm going to kind of just skip to the bottom here. This is actual code from the Brave browser. Brave has a file called decentralized DNS. And they say that they support unstoppable domains. HTTPS resolver.unstoppable.io. That's what Brave Browser is doing to resolve the decentralized DNS. And this affects me emotionally. Like, this is humiliating. Like, the, why are you calling it decentralized DNS? It goes to a legacy ICANN domain.io with legacy certificate authority. I just. <laughs> All right, and then and finally, DNS records on the blockchain. So a, a lot of these blockchain naming systems are, like I said, are more concerned about wallet naming than actual websites. Handshake, we kind of try to preserve the DNS website idea. So if you want to put it in a record, for example, on your ENS name, first of all, it's, it's very hard, it's very hard to do. None of the websites that run ENS allow you to do that. Um, Mike Carson, a friend of mine, was able to buy an ENS name, humbly.eth, and put an A record on it manually. He had to create this Ethereum transaction manually because Ethereum naming system just is not set up for DNS. It's just a secondary thing. Anyway, so so you can see the Ethereum transaction here. It's kind of cool. There's the DNS record in, in DNS legacy wire format there at the bottom. I translated it for you. You can see the humble.eth IP address. I circled $24.20. That's how much it cost Mike to put that A record on the Ethereum blockchain. And this is the problem with putting uh, you know, DNS records on a blockchain. Blockchains are expensive, uh, they're slow, they're very secure, and they're obviously incredibly useful. That's why I'm here, that's why I've been in this space for so long. Um, but for things like this, it doesn't seem right. If you want to update your A record a couple times a day, or change, rotate the DNS set key or something like that, you don't want to be putting all, the, all your DNS records on the blockchain. But this is the model that all those other blockchain systems are trying to get you to do. Um, 
put all your data publicly on the blockchain instead of the name server. Um, and it's expensive, and, and, and so I don't think it's, it's particularly useful. All right, so scaling. Um, so this is a picture of a block. I'll call it an artist's rendition of a block. We talk about blockchains. Something about that has something to do with a block. This is all you kind of need to know. A block basically looks like this. It's got a bunch of data. Bitcoin, Namecoin, Handshake. You get a block that looks like this. It's about one megabyte. You get one about every 10 minutes. It's a reasonable amount of processing to expect somebody with a computer to be able to do. One megabyte of data every 10 minutes. By the way, systems like um, Ethereum, it's a lot faster. You get a piece of data like this about every 10 seconds or faster. So right away, if you're switching from Bitcoin to Ethereum, you're gonna be computing a lot more, almost 10 times as, as much, just because you have to verify this stuff that fast. Um, and so this is what a full node verifies. Let's just say a full node verifies the entire block. All the rules, every transaction, every cryptographic signature, every protocol rule, nobody's cheating, nobody's lying. The proof of work that somebody flipped a coin 60 times, it's all good. So like clients. A like client only needs to verify a limited amount of data in the block, particularly the header, which is a little bit of metadata at the top, and then a few little bits, depending on what you want to know. Because if you're a, a, a like client, let's say my cell phone, I don't need my cell phone to verify every single handshake transaction ever. All I need to know is what's the IP address for library genesis, and somebody can provide me a proof, just a little bit of data, that comes from the block, and that's all I need that's what my phone needs to say, okay, I can, I can trust this response. Um, and the light client is essential to Handshake. In fact, I would argue it's, it's the one thing that's the, the most important thing. If you read the Handshake design white paper, you can tell this was a system that was designed with the light client first, which is unlike any other cryptocurrency system. Um, well, except perhaps Bitcoin, because Satoshi Nakamoto also uh, wrote about a light client in the original Bitcoin white paper. So this isn't, again, this isn't something we invented. Um, Ethereum, also, you can have a light client for Ethereum, but they don't work. There's no full nodes out there providing proofs, and you still have to process block headers every 10 seconds. It's just, it's a burden. Um, but Handshake was designed with the light client in mind. So, uh, I got, got a couple Raspberry Pis here. I don't know if you guys are familiar with these, but a Raspberry Pi is basically a $50 computer. It's really, really stripped down. Raspberry Pi like this, $50 computer is all you need to fully verify the entire Bitcoin blockchain, the entire Handshake blockchain, the entire Namecoin blockchain. It's pretty good, pretty cheap. Um, the little guy at the bottom is a Raspberry Pi Zero. Now that is a $5 computer. With that little guy, you can verify all the Handshake headers and you can run a Handshake light client and view these Handshake websites with total security without anybody involved, no trusted third party, blah, 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 without having to use unstoppable.io slash resolver slash DNS, whatever. <laughs> Um, directly from that Raspberry Pi Zero to the web server, the guy who owns it. Um, and these computers talk to each other. So we request proofs from the full nodes, we verify the data, we never have to trust anybody because we can verify the data, it's all cryptographically, it's all there. And by the way, you cannot run an Ethereum full node even on the big Raspberry Pi. That $50 Raspberry Pi, you can't run an Ethereum full node there. Which means that like, when we talk about um, accessibility, okay, you got a bunch of rich kids with nice laptops, great. Run an Ethereum full node on there, enjoy it. But we're talking about a, the world here, right? The internet, people on the fringes of the internet, cheap computers, low bandwidth, limited access to technology. If we really want something that's gonna work on a global scale, it's gotta work on the tiniest hardware and still without the trusted third parties. That's, that makes sense, that is a, that's a system that scales. And there's a lot of trade-offs with that. Again, let's talk about it at the bar. You know, we have to give up some stuff to make this work, but I think that this is essential. Um, all right, so you know, that's, that's the exciting stuff. How do you get to these domains, the Handshake domain securely? If you wanna buy a Handshake domain today, you wanna tell your friends how to get to it. Um, my company, Impervious, uh, has several applications that, that have that light client. I keep bragging about the light client is in there. Um, Fingertip is a uh, web app. It's, an, it's an ex or not a web app, sorry, a, 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 like a menu bar applet. It's an extension. Um, it works with any browser. So people are like, oh, can I go to Handshake domains uh, with, with Brave, Opera, Safari, Chrome, Firefox? Yeah, you can. You install this thing on your computer. It verifies the Dane. I'll tell you about it at the bar. And you can use it with any browser, easy. We also have a browser. It's called Beacon Browser. It's a fork of Chromium. It's the only browser I know of to date that actually verifies Dane natively. And it also has the Handshake light client built into it. 
So if you have Windows, Linux, uh, even iOS, the screenshots I took in the, for the first slide for my phone were for Beacon from iOS. You install it, it syncs the block headers, it takes about 30 seconds to, to connect to the blockchain, and then you're good. Then you are talking to these <coughs> web servers that are owned by people who can stand in front of their private key with a gun if that's your thing, and close the loop. No third parties, no HTTPS to Infura or unstoppabledomains.io or anything like that. Um, really quick, if you want to get into Handshake, these are two really great on-ramps. Namebase.io is, uh, is an exchange. It's a lot like Coinbase, if you're familiar with Coinbase's relationship to Bitcoin. Namebase is probably the best way to get involved with Handshake. You can buy the Handshake token with um, dollars or credit card or whatever. You can get involved in the auctions. BobWallet.io, Bob Wallet is a full node. Okay, you can also run it as a light client. It's a piece of software you download your computer. You can interact with the blockchain directly without any third parties, without signing up or giving anybody your bank account name or anything like that. Um, and so I just have it the same. This is an older auction. This is a, an auction for a top level domain, Apple, uh, Statue of Liberty. Um, and you can just see that I'm both on Mainbase and on Bob Wallet. Um, uh, you can interact with this auction. Um, so that's basically all I wanted to share with you guys. The, the community, like Noel said, is, is broad, decentralized, diverse. There is no Handshake Foundation. There's no CEO. I don't work for Handshake. Handshake cannot be sued. It's just a protocol. Um, there's lots of ways to chat with us. Telegram, IRC, Discord. Um, there is an at HNS Twitter handle. Um, I recommend not to follow it because that is a central authority and I don't believe in those. But if you follow HNS with the hashtag, you'll see the community at large tweeting about Handshake. Um, that's it. Thanks for your time.